you for, uh, for having me here. It was uh, really interesting to hear your talk on economics uh, as an entrepreneur myself. Um, I might want to encourage some of you to think about like my business as I talk about how I came to make some of the decisions that I did um, along the way. Um, and so I'm going to talk just briefly about my career journey to this point so you have some context on who I am and what I do. And then I'd love to just open it up to questions. I have tons and tons of uh, listeners to my podcast who are graduate students, postdocs, uh, great universities around the country. So I know that the kinds of things that I write and talk about in biotech uh, have a lot of relevance uh, for you. So I want to make time for your questions. Um, okay, so for me, uh, so I, um, uh, Farm kid from a small town in Wisconsin, uh, rural, kind of isolated place. I went to the University of Wisconsin Madison to study journalism, the big state school. And I thought, you know, um, I'll, uh, I want to study journalism. I worked on the school paper, wrote about local sports, uh, and I thought, uh, I'm just going to study journalism and see where that goes. Madison, the big city in, Mad in Wisconsin, or uh, one of them, and uh, I would just like journalism was, was a ticket to ask questions of anybody about anything. Like I could talk about the world, the wider world out there in all different domains that I knew very little about because it was a rural place. Um, so I ran about sports for a while. Um, eventually, kind of tired of that. I wanted to still have fun watching games and <laughs> not have it be my job. Got into a, a coverage of local politics. Eventually got into business. Eventually got a job out of uh, my first newspaper job came from an internship actually at the Seattle Times. So that's how I ended up in Seattle. Um, great newspaper, history of winning Pulitzers, really good people that I could learn from, uh, editors and reporters both. And about a year into that experience, I got this opportunity to cover the biotech industry. And I knew nothing about this. I didn't study any of that in college. Uh, I had no idea that a, a biotech revolution was brewing. Uh, but uh, I looked at this. At the time, uh, Seattle had a, a great legacy in cancer biology and immunology. Uh, and it had some companies that had grown up from where NASDAQ publicly traded at the time. So there was actually a job at a newspaper <laughs> where you could full time cover something specialized. Uh, there's a company in particular called Immunex, which was sort of like the Genentech of Seattle. They had developed this drug called Enbro, which was uh, a really big advance for rheumatoid arthritis. They made tons of money and uh, helped a lot of patients. And it was a really interesting company to, to cover. I kind of got hooked uh, in that first year of covering biotech for the local newspaper. And there's this amazing mix of science, there's benefit for human health. There's economic issues, like what do you set your price at for a, a wonder drug for rheumatoid arthritis? Um, how, how do you how do you you know serve all the patients? Uh, you can. Uh, there's there's ethical issues that are wound up in there too. Um, they ended up having a uh, manufacturing shortage, um, which um, when patients are like desperately depending for their lives on your drug, that's um, Bad, pretty bad thing when you scoop up. Um, they, they had to answer to people. So like I just got I got hooked right away. Biotech was going to be it for me. And I worked uh, so uh, people in the scientific community were generous with their time to take a, a non-scientist and, uh, and educate me uh, so that I could then educate the wider world of readers. Uh, stayed there for about six years. As I look back, it's almost kind of like getting a graduate school, a graduate school experience in biotech journalism. It's like, okay, I got out of there, got my PhD in biotech journalism now, uh, decided that this is like really the thing that I want to do. Um, did a stop at Bloomberg News um, in San Francisco. So that was around the time when, um, so this is 2007 or so, and I was uh, beginning to realize that the economics of my industry were fundamentally disrupted, uh, as Professor Sable alluded to. Deflationary economics were coming to journalism. Newspapers, uh, as they existed before, were going to go away. I needed to do something different, like to move into electronic media if I wanted to continue to do 
what I love to do. So I went to Bloomberg News, it was a great company based here in New York, uh, but I, I was in San Francisco. And this is a way for me to expand my um, portfolio, if you will, from cancer and immunology companies to the other areas of biotech, like HIV or diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. I could go out, you know, by learning about companies in each of these areas, I could learn uh, the, the major questions in each of these fields. Each has their own particular uh, business challenges as well as scientific questions that need to be answered. Um, and, and I covered like the big, the, the best known companies that were, you know, visible stocks. So kind of moving from regional to national biotech coverage for a couple of years, decided, you know what, um, I'm not super interested in necessarily the events that move stocks so much, which tend to be the Phase three trial results, the up or down, you know, did you get your primary endpoint or not? That was kind of what Bloomberg was set up to focus on at that time. Um, I missed some of the, the most innovative entrepreneurial startup, like two guys in a dog companies, all the way up through the most interesting projects, say at Genentech. So uh, I got a call to the opportunity to join a startup uh, called Exconomy, and this is 2008. The, now very clearly becoming the, the place of where people were going to, where the readers were going, where the advertisers were increasingly going, print newspapers were, were going away. Um, I wanted to be a part of building something from the ground up uh, on the web. So I went to work and I, uh, at Next Economy, moved back to Seattle, uh, but built up a series of bureaus around the country um, to uh, focus on innovation. So the translational science, let's say, that was getting venture capital funding, the kinds of things that people were building companies around um, in each of these scientific, scientific areas. Um, and I, it, was a, it was a success. I worked there for six years, uh, grew uh, readership uh, considerably, uh, and then uh, had this uh, idea to uh, write my own book. I won't spend a lot of time on that, but it's a biography of Lee Hood, the inventor of led the team who developed the first automated DNA sequencer. Uh, so it's a hood trailblazer of the genomics age. This is an age where the technology um, gave rise to a whole new branch of science. It was really exciting. So um, I had that itch to write a book and, and did so. Took some time off to do that. And then um, said, okay, what am I gonna do next? If I'm going to start my own company. Um, at this point, I was pretty um, well known for sensibility about how the industry works and, um, and how it ought to, or I could go work at a big media company. I decided to start my own thing, so I'm there for it, and I actually left my car up here, so I'm to grab it on the way back. But, um, so that was five years ago, <laughs> and uh, um, that was my, uh, I think entrepreneurs can come in lots of different shapes and roles. I think I was an entrepreneur as an early employee economy, figuring things out, how to attract readers on that platform. Uh, but uh, as I thought about my business, um, one thing, so we were free and open content on X economy, and um, the business model was largely built on events. So we would host conferences, sell tickets, sell sponsorships to those events. And uh, I found that after a while, I, with all the incentives in, that, in our business were toward doing more and more events and not as much spending the time and energy on getting that next story that, that I wanted to do. So that was part of it. The, uh, and that influenced my thinking around Timmerman Report, which was the thing that I'm uniquely best at and that I love to do the most is the, the reporting, the writing, the analysis, the journalism. So I need to create a structure that where I get rewarded for doing that. Um, so Timmerman Report is a subscription model, uh, annual subscriptions. They started at $99 a year, and I have some rationale for how I arrived at that price if anybody wants to ask. But uh, $99 a year, you get everything that Timmerman
everyone's got to say about biotech. And my plan was two to three, four articles a week. I wasn't going to try to compete on turning the flywheel most aggressively or creating the most quantity. But again, that, that sort of that, that analysis, that depth, that sensibility, that, uh, that was mine and mine alone. Um, that was something that I might be able to eke out um, enough subscribers to, to support me and make a living uh, continuing to do what I really want to do in an otherwise, you know, <laughs> deflationary market of abundance. Lots and lots of sources, right? Not all of them are, are the same, not all of them you can trust, but um, it's out there, right? And competing for your attention. <clears throat> so I started Temperament Report five years ago, and um, you know, I should probably mention, you know, again, like entrepreneurship comes in some different shapes and forms. About two and a half years ago now, um, so I had this other, other self, <laughs> other hobby in mountaineering. I've been climbing mountains for like 15 years. In the summer of 2017, about two and a half years in, I'm telling them to report. Um, I have this great platform, right? Lots of people following my, my newsletter, social media, et cetera. Um, I had gotten myself ready to climb a Himalayan peak, in particular Mount Everest. And I said, okay, you know, this has always been just my personal hobby, something that I've done with friends, but um, if I were to climb Mount Everest, uh, I, could, I could basically electrify this network, this platform of very um, wealthy and successful people who are in the healthcare and biotech industry I could activate them, inspire them uh, around a cause, uh, in particular a scientific cause that I care about and that my network cares about. So um, long story short, I went to the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, which is a great um, institution. They actually had a mountain climbing fundraising kind of program, kind of like one of those bicycle events that you hear about or for mountains. Uh, made a proposal, I said I want to climb Mount Everest, I want to do it as a fundraiser for cancer research, um, and uh, put together a plan and to raise $175,000, ended up raising $340,000, climbing Mount Everest successfully, uh, and, uh, and then that gave birth to like a whole new climb to fight cancer. It, it basically became a non-profit spin-off of my business. It's kind of like my second entrepreneurial role. Climbed by Cancer, I did Kilimanjaro Expedition last summer that brought together a whole bunch of the biotech executives and investors to participate and raise money themselves by joining me on that trip. That one raised 1.6 million. So now this is becoming an annual thing. It's raised something like $2 million for cancer research, and I think it can continue to go for many, many years. So I've got like my business over here that I've started, the, the nonprofit spin-off going off over here. Um, those are for the things that, I, that are keeping me, keeping me really busy. I'm also trying to think about writing another book. I don't know if I'll ever get to that. <laughs> but um, um, I, I think that's kind of, you know, that's like my biographical sketch. So that gives you some contextual um, view on, on where I come from. Um, but I, I would really, I mean, I, I've got opinions about just about everything Dave was talking about up here and how it applies to biotech, the economics of it, this, this tool of the science. So I, I just love to hear what questions you all have um, about either what I've done or, or current topics in biotech, whatever's on your mind. Yeah. So in the beginning of your talk, you said, you kind of not you off, you said that you decided to start your own company instead of going to work at a big media company. And I kind of view that as choosing like a riskier versus a safer decision. And as students, I think we're, we're all kind of in a mostly a pipeline that says go to college, get a good degree, go work for a big company that's safe and will make you money and just work your way up. That decision that you made was a bigger decision than you just glossed over. So, how did you, like going back to that decision, how did you make that, that choice to then take the riskier side and start your own company versus kind of going for the, the safer bet? Great question. Yeah. Uh, I was very much like that. I never imagined myself as an entrepreneur uh, and coming up in college. I always thought, yeah, I will go get a job at a media company and I'll make a salary and, and benefits. And, 
you know, if I do well at the Seattle Times, maybe I will get a job at the New York Times someday or, you know, whatever. Uh, but that wasn't really in the cards, uh, given that there were a lot of external forces acting, uh, you know, as I was coming up in, in journalism. So um, by the time I started my own company, this would have been 20, late 2014, early 2015. So I'm in a very different place at that point. I had 15 years of experience. this kind of mythical archetype, I think, of like the 25-year-old in the hoodie, you know, everybody's got to be Mark Zuckerberg to be an entrepreneur, and that's like, yeah, and that's just false. Um, I remember when I started, I was 39 years old, and uh, there was some study that the Kauffman Foundation or something came out with that said, if the median or the, like the midpoint uh, entrepreneur is exactly 39 years old, <laughs> and, and, and that, there was a thesis around that, that which was very much in sync with where I was. It's like, it's, it's a person who has gained a lot of experience already and a lot of understanding of the market that he or she is trying to serve. Uh, and is still like in their prime of their energy and abilities and insights and like capable of taking on something as, as daunting as, um, you know, an, an unknown, as a, a new company or, or even a new, uh, new twist on the model. Um, so, so yeah, calculated risk. And fortunately, um, I'm here five years later, and here we are. Yeah. Uh, going back to your twenties in Seattle when you first started, could you talk a little bit more about how you first got into uh, tech city and how you started covering it? Um, how did you manage to cover without, you know, much background about the industry? How long did it take you to kind of feel that? You're proficient enough, or knew more like enough about the industry to say, you know, I, this is my area. This is my industry that I cover. Uh, at first, it was really scary. Uh, I I couldn't even read the press releases. I, I'd read them, and I just I had to go look at the dictionary. Or, you know, online. I couldn't understand what people were talking about the terminology. It was scary. Now, remember, I worked at a general interest newspaper. So like what little I knew, the editors knew even less. <laughs> uh, they just knew that this was like a hot area that, that people in the town were talking about. We should have somebody covering it. And I was really fortunate that I had good supportive editors, patient people who uh, let me learn on the job. Again, that scientific community of Seattle uh, was very understanding and patient. They, you know, scientists, they, they love to talk about their work. And anybody who's like a, a curious, uh, you know, ambitious questioner can come on in the lab and, you know, learn about it. And um, uh, I didn't have bone-crushing deadline pressure either. This was really important. I had 
basically, you know, to write two, three, maybe four articles a week to keep my editors happy. Like I could just go out of the office and you know, without with no adult supervision. <laughs> go out into the lab, you know, talk to some scientists about what they're doing with this cancer drug over here, come back on Wednesday, write up a story that's, you know, 850 words that your average Seattleite might want to read. And, you know, if they, if they liked it, you know, I could keep going. <laughs> and uh, so I, I kept doing that and just kind of cumulatively gained a little more confidence. But, it, I mean, this was the learning curve was steep. I mean, uh, you know, I two years, maybe three years before I really felt like, okay, I, I think I kind of have a handle here and, uh, and, and feel like this is something I want to do longer term. Uh, that, that was another fork in the road because, you know, general interest newspaper journalists tend not to specialize in an area for 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, people tend to get like hired somewhere else or, or go do something different. They, they, would, they would often rotate. But I, we actually, I had this conversation with an editor um, about switching over to coverage of both about three or four years. And like, wow, Luke, you've done well on biotechnology. Why don't you go cover like the really big important company in town, Boeing? And one of the senior editors, in his wisdom, actually overruled that and said, and, and I thought, what the hell? You're taking away my promotion. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he's like, no, Luke owns this beat now in biotechnology in town. Like the other, we had two newspapers then. The other newspaper like can't touch us on this. Like we're the go-to source for this. So like let's um, let's play to that strength. And I took that personally to say, all right, um, maybe I, you know, really ought to commit myself long term. And again, to, I flipped it this, the, you know, expand my repertoire. Like, okay, I think I know the key questions in some of these cancer uh, fields, but what about, like, there's a lot still that I don't know. And that's another great thing about biotech, it's so, it's moving, it's constantly changing. I just kept finding new companies and new, new things popping up that were interesting. It wasn't just like, oh, you know, Singapore Airlines ordered 100 planes and now, you know, another order came in next week. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it's a process. It, it was definitely no master plan, that's for sure. But once I locked in, then uh, I became a little more directed. I, I skipped over, I, I did a, a fellowship uh, for science journalists at MIT. So I took a sabbatical year, kind of in between Seattle Times and Bloomberg. That's, that was around the time when it was like, okay, I, I think I want to specialize and do this for the long term. I think biotech's gonna be interesting. I like doing this stuff. Um, so I, I took a nine month, it's the Knight Foundation, the formerly Knight Litter Newspapers, uh, bless them, they have this program where you know, journalists at mid-career level can come in and I can take, I can audit a bunch of classes. So I upped my game. I didn't get it, it wasn't a degree program, didn't get an actual PhD, didn't do anybody's experiments in the lab. Don't, don't get me wrong. But, you know, continue to accumulate um, knowledge of the field. Um, I feel like journalism in the biotech industry is very complex and sensitive. Uh, and you're, you're, you're writing about an industry that's trying to serve, an industry that's trying to help um, but sometimes companies don't always do the most ethical things. And like, for example, this summer there was a pharma company that had um, some drug, and I think it was an inflammatory drug, um, but there was some indication with Alzheimer's that they very didn't pursue. Um, and then it came out in the news that they could have pursued it in some clinical trials or something they chose not to. And it really hurt the reputation. And I think it also probably hurt the reputation of biotech in general and maybe affected how much people thought, the, the average person thought biotech served an important role in, in society and in healthcare, um, and maybe it impacted how much they advocated for their senators to ask Congress or whatever to uh, increase funding for biotech or healthcare. So I'm just curious, uh, what, like when you have to go and write about a story, do you think about the role you play in the bigger scheme of things um, not just you know, depicting the facts, but also framing it and what this means for the broader industry. Yes, yeah, so um, 
my role. I, you know, uh, I, I, I see a lot of bad behavior in the pharmaceutical industry, things that are not consistent with what a lot of people now refer to as a social contract. Um, kind of just rank profit maximization that doesn't really mesh well with the, um, the human health mission. Um, and I call companies on the carpet and it, they behave badly. Uh, that said, I think there are a lot of cases where the pharmaceutical industry has gotten a bad rap and is not, doesn't get the credit. It's, it's nuanced, I would say. So, you know, Professor Sabin mentioned the case of spinal muscular atrophy. There have been actually two drugs that have come through there with devastating disease that um, they had parents and kids had no options at all. Uh, and now, like, they have got a serious, seriously shared the sentiment with me about, you know, how Barbara and Biotech wears a black hat, and I, I, I think that they just don't see a lot of the good things that come out and that are coming out. You know, I've been doing this now for 20 years. The first 10 years, the, the aughts, um, there was not that much to write about. There was not that much to really write home about. The number of drugs coming through the FDA approval process were fewer, and the ones that did were just Cancer drugs that would extend life by immediate time for three months, uh, help maybe 20% of patients shrink it for a while, and then it would recur. Now, we've got so many success stories like spinal muscular atrophy, cystic fibrosis, hepatitis C, um, lots of inflammatory diseases, various kinds of cancers, not all cancer, but you know, the, the immunotherapy, the, the checkpoint inhibitors that release brakes on the immune system. We've got patients with who had death sentences um, who, who um, are now like living 5, 10, 20 years um, with cancer as a chronic disease. So we, in my view, is that we as a society need to figure out how to better distribute these innovations, how to support the science to continue creating the, the foundation for more of these things. Keep some kind of set incentive structure in place so that the inventors and the investors can be rewarded, but rewarded to a point. You know, monopoly pricing or permanent monopolies, um, it's not working. It's not working very well. We, we, we got a real problem we need to fix. Excellent question. <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, it's uh, fifty dollars a year. So this is a you know. Um, to, to, if anybody cares about my pricing, we can nerd out on this. But um, I started at ninety nine dollars a year, and then I found out after about a year that actually people were willing to pay more than that. And uh, <laughs> because of the peculiarities of consumer expectations in the pharmaceutical industry, everybody thinks they need to get a discount even off of $99, and that was just like too much for me uh, to like give you like a 20% discount off of 99. So I, I recognized like quirks of economics, really what I ought to do is raise the price to $149. Nobody's that price sensitive. Like if it's worth 99, it's worth 149 to you. Uh, they, people were not that price sensitive, but the funny thing was people were actually, they felt better about getting a 10% discount off of 149 than paying just like the everyday low <laughs> <laughs> I, I It's like, all right, people, this is how it's going to be. Like, it's 149, and anybody who groups want to come in, you can get your discount. And like students, you can get, you know, a two thirds off discount. Um, I try to uh, uh, sell more institutional subscriptions. It often takes a critical mass at a university. So, like, 
what takes really like four or five students from a given university to go to the library and say, hey, we want this? And usually the librarian is like, okay, and we'll get like an institutional license, they have a budget for this thing, um, and you know, then I can extend it to everybody in the class or um, faculty and, and staff as well. So I've done that at a handful of institutions, not yet at Columbia, but if any individuals want it, you know, let me know and I'll give you like a, a special individual code that I can yeah, um, get. Sorry, same question. Sorry. Yeah. Resources and essentially, people of the United States would pay a little less, and people of developed countries in Europe and elsewhere would pay more. Um, they, those countries, pay artificially low prices in many cases. So, like the UK, for instance, will just, you know, they have a, a single payer healthcare system where they can go to Novartis, the maker of the spinomuscular atrophy drug, and say, all right, you know, you guys charge two million in the United States. We'll pay you two hundred thousand or whatever it is. You take it or leave it. Like you just don't sell them into the UK. And we have the balls to say no. We will deprive our UK citizens of that SMA drug. They've done this with cystic fibrosis. Vertex Pharmaceuticals has the rate for cystic fibrosis. It's three hundred and forty thousand dollars a year in the United States for a drug that you take continually the rest of your life to stay healthy. Um, UK said we're not paying. They denied their citizens of the life saving drug for cystic fibrosis. Uh, we don't really can't stump, we don't do that in the United States. We with our patchwork of private health insurance and, and public uh, programs we don't. Um, we just pay. Um, and uh, so That's fancy land, that's not really going to happen at like the UN level. So, what are we going to do in the United States? And, you know, this is very much an open question that we're, we are grappling with here in 2020. Medicare for all, or some kind of, you know, international indexing, some of you may have heard about. Uh, the Trump administration wants to set American prices on branded drugs at something like 125% of the international average. So, if I were to use that example of, say, cystic fibrosis, say, it's two hundred. Uh, it's it's two hundred thousand dollars in other countries. Um, we in the United States would pay just like twenty five percent above, and that's that. Take it or leave it. That's the United States law. And you know, pharmaceutical industry would would um, naturally object. Price controls. It would. Um, it would uh, dissuade investment in new companies. So capital. I worry about um, blunt. I, I worry about like something like a Medicare for all. While it's got a justice component to it and extending access in the right way, um, it would have pretty significant uh, downside in discouraging investments in therapies. Yeah. Um, could you please share some of your insights upon um, what are the most important trends happening during the recent year in the biotech industry, in your opinions? Most important trends. Well, drug pricing, like what are we going to do about drug pricing is first and foremost. Uh, it's been brewing like this populist backlash for uh, a number of years. I think it's really a fever pitch. It's going to get a lot more intense this year uh, during the election cycle. And uh, people in the pharmaceutical industry are on You've seen actually in the last couple weeks as a result some big financings getting done 
I've heard people do Morgan Healthcare Conference in San Francisco. Just this is this annual event back in January. It's the annual fundraising kickoff for the sector. People say, well, <laughs> you know, you better raise your money uh, before the Iowa caucuses. Because, uh, you know, some stuff could really happen to like dampen sentiment uh, and make it very difficult. So it's the old saying, you know, make hay while the sun is shining. <coughs> Raise money while you can. Get two or three, four years worth of cash to run your business. Uh, your money losing business, probably your therapy, by the way, right. so that you can like weather the storm and hopefully come up with a decent enough set of data to come out the other side and be able to test it. Uh, so drug pricing, you know, I mean, scientific trends. Geez, there's a lot. I mean, cancer immunotherapy is really exciting. Gene therapy, as you mentioned. Um, So you, what, what you've got 
I mentioned Kendall Square Mafia. It's out there in San Francisco too, like these two main hubs. But it's a it's a relationships business, and there's there's flaws with that. You know, a lot of middle-aged white dude venture capitalists who like to back people that look like them, right? It's hard. It's it's hard for a young person to crack into that world. So I would. And yeah, it's like a reverse age discrimination. In tech, they want the 25-year-old. In biotech, they want the 45-year-old. They want some gray hair. Um, I think it's probably, the, I, I've actually written columns before to this effect. Like, what would my advice be? My advice would be to go work at a company. Uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if, if that's like where you see yourself in your 30s or 40s, company, like a variety of experiences is really good. So, working at a company, especially like a mid-sized growth company, um, like two guys and a dog, like you're, they're probably gonna look and say like, we don't, like, we don't have enough experience or something. Pfizer or Merck can be okay if you have like a really good boss, but you can get pigeonholed, like you get really good at one thing, and that's like all people ever see you as. But if you find like a sweet spot, like a mid-cap company that's growing, uh, that's a really good one. Where you know you you can start, you can get in the door, and then gain a variety of experiences because there's so much to learn in biotech. There's the science, there's the clinical development, there's the financing, the communications. I mean, um, and nobody knows it all, uh, and especially when they're starting. So getting that kind of breadth of experiences, and you know, even moving around like to even in the investment side of things, a stint there. Um, regulatory is fantastic. Like anybody who like has a stint at the FDA, like you know, Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner, like everybody wants him on their board or consulting to them because like he has this mix of experiences now. So like um, yeah, go someplace with good experienced people who will give you a little bit of niche where you can learn a lot. Some people may say working for top consulting firms such as Bain, McKinsey, or BCG may contribute to being an entrepreneur in the future. Um, do you agree with these opinions and what's your view? You know, there are a lot of people who go that route straight out of college. I'd say it can be good for a while. I wouldn't stay very long. Um, I think, you know, consulting is kind of a racket. Like, you got this kind of buzzword bingo. You know, you can make a slide and say, you know, we're, we're transforming this or that. I mean, uh, you know, but you don't really own the solutions. Like, it's, it's kind of easy to come out as, you know, I'm the smartest guy in the room. Here's what y'all are do. And I'll work on a project for a company for a few months and then leave. Somebody at the company needs to implement it and make it work. They own it. Uh, and that is a different kind of task. I think that's where, um, you know, it's like, that, that's the entrepreneurial essence. Like, you figure it out. <laughs> it's do or die. You make it happen. Um, there, there might not be a template. You can't, like, call a consultant and say, well, this is, this is how it's going to work. Um, so, but the nice thing about consulting is you can get exposed to a variety of different companies with a variety of different business challenges. And after a while, you can accumulate a breadth of experiences. A little bit like journalism, actually. Like, I, I kind of flit around from really bad to really bad. And I right. learn about each company's little set of peculiar challenges. And, um, you know, that's that's good for, for me. Consulting um, is another way you can get a, a window into yeah. that. But, yeah, eventually operating experience. Um, how, how, are, how, how do you make the industry reacting to our concern about the say that the science has been under invested. Uh, alternative pain mechanisms uh, is an area where we just haven't made a big NIH or philanthropy kind of investment as a society. So you've got a venture capital and entrepreneurial community that's kind of looking around and saying, what do we do? I mean, there's nothing like, it 
It's not like cancer where you can say, all right, we've got a lot of biology here, a, a really strong therapeutic rationale. If we put 100 million in for the next five years, there's a decent likelihood of success. Um, so, and you know, some of these abuse deterrent approaches to opioids are kind of small bites of the apple, not really going to get us uh, where we got to go. Um, so, I, I think that the answer is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, advertising model. Uh, you like to read about the Kardashians? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, I don't really want to write about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the things that I uh, like to write about, like to learn about, are what I like to refer to as low popularity but high affinity. So, by that I mean. Um, if I write about you know the new drug for spinal muscular atrophy and put spinal muscular atrophy in a headline, that's not going to get as many clicks as the Kardashians. So if you're getting like a fraction of a penny per click, uh, you need to get you know millions and millions of clicks for an advertising based business model to work. You're not going to get millions and millions of clicks for writing about spinal muscular atrophy or pancreatic cancer or any of the things that I that I do. But the, the kinds of stories that I write, and I learned this from the market, uh, not formal market research during my economy days, but like an overwhelming amount of anecdotal feedback, which was, hey Luke, you wrote that story that was really good and clear about my approach to spinal muscular atrophy, and the next day I got a call from the head of BD at Merck, and that set up a like. You altered the destiny of my company. <laughs> you you helped me get a job at the company down the street. Like I, I heard these things, and it's like, holy oh, shit! I need that for free. <laughs> <laughs> I did, and, and then on Monday, and on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, and it's like, all right, people are just going to have to pay. Like, oh, no, so, and I, you know, I recognize like I'm in like this world of you know total abundance of content, right? The, the scarcity that once existed in the newspaper world where I grew up is gone. Like, there's a gazillion sources you can turn to. Everybody's clamoring for your attention, and it's all free. Some of it's good, a lot of it's not. But um, I just have to say, who am I? I, I what do I do? I, I, I want to create high-value news analysis reporting on People are just going to have to pay a little something. Not a lot, but that was not the pricing reality or the consumer expectations when I started. Consumer expectations were, hey, look, you gave me that story that altered the destiny of my company, and I want it for free. Like, you know, or, you know, one one hundredth of a penny per ad click or whatever. I'll, I'll trade my email address, hey, whatever. But um, no, so I decided $99 a year, and then I raised it to $149, and I've kept it there ever since. Um, how do you keep up to date with the stories that you write? And because you're saying that you, you are writing four articles per week, how do you like know what to write about? Or you have like a set of codes and you or you can cover a story and then Yeah, so lots of PR there's a big PR industry out there of people seeking attention for companies. So there um, there's all of that inbound. Um, clamoring for me to write about people or put them on a podcast or what have you. Um, I used to respond to more of those things. Uh, I now am more outbound. So um, I'll just, I'll see something that I think is interesting and I often will write directly to the CEO and say, I'd like to talk to you about your company or about your industry issues. So it's sort of like after a while, Playing more on offense. Like, what is what is it I find interesting? And I think my readers will value. Yeah. Related to the story, uh, to the question of how you keep track of what's coming out, um, you mentioned communication as well through through social media and other conferences, networking. Would you say that those are also important? Yes. 
Yes, I, uh, I do the social media on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is this, for one reason or another, it evolved as like the place, like the water cooler for the biotech community to come in and share latest developments in science and regulatory events and financings. Uh, and there's like a really good nucleus being part of the bio Twitter group of uh, people that, um, that are exchanging conversations that are actually quite productive, I think, in, in many cases. It's better, I'd say it's like one of the better um, islands within Twitter. There's a lot of stuff people want to report. But um, so the conferences, yeah, I'm going to the bio CEO conference, the Marriott Marquis, on Monday, Tuesday, while I'm here. So I'll meet with a number of companies, hear their various pitches they're making to investors. I'll think about, you know, if I hear 20 in a day, I might follow up with one or two. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I read other, you know, scientific literature, I can pass on uh, as well. So, yeah, it's kind of like a whole great big gamish of like where the information comes in and how I process it. It's probably not a great answer, but I'm just curious. But, yeah. um, so this is more of like an entrepreneurship question, but you mentioned this archetype of like a Mark Zuckerberg type of guy in a hoodie who's young. He comes up with some revolutionary idea like in the shower. Assuming that that doesn't happen to you, um, how do you know when your idea is good enough if it's not like some sort of like life-changing revolutionary thing and based on, so either in your experience or based on the companies that you research and then also based on that, do you think that you can learn that sort of behavior, like learn innovation or how to come up with those ideas or do you think it's like a divine inspiration type of situation? <laughs> well, it's a good sign when, you know, I get a lot of, I get ideas in the shower too, like a lot of people do, right? And uh, often they're, they're fleeting. I try to write them down uh, in a notebook and keep it with me, like if I'm on, you know, on a plane or on the subway or something. Um, a good sign is if you can't let it go, like it keeps coming up, and, and you've got that obsession that she was referring to, because uh, you need the obsession to actually keep going. So that's a good sign. But also just talking to people. I mean, conducting what you might call an informal market research. So uh, I would talk to my subscribers. If I've got a new idea, like, I want to start the long run podcast. I, I, I want to do like long form interviews. The whole world says, you, you know, every radio segment ought to be 20 minutes. But like, I had that idea in 2017. But actually, you know what? I want to have people talk for a full hour. I don't want them to talk in sound bites. And I want to talk about their personal journey, who they are as people, and how they came to their opportunity that they're currently doing in biotech. That's really interesting. So I'm going to create a one hour show, and I will then I'll pressure test. He mentioned being your own worst critic. Absolutely, yes. Uh, just because I've got an idea, I don't necessarily think that it's going to work. I, I will go to a, a subscriber who knows um, my um, my style and also some of my readers and say, "Hey, what do you think of this? Is this like half baked, or you know, does it need a little more work?" Um, so, and then uh, you know, I guess you know, people look at big companies have budgets for like official market research and you can make it data driven and all that, but like at the, at the ground level, like if you're a solo entrepreneur, if I talk to a dozen of my loyal subscribers uh, who, who I trust to give me unfiltered feedback, I'll pressure test it. If it's not any good, I'll, I'll drop it for the rest. Uh, I'm afraid I would love to spend two more hours doing this. Uh, I think the class would too. Unfortunately, we have to make us happen. Uh, I cannot thank you. Uh, I want to do a little commercial for some of this stuff. I read the Timberman Report religiously. The, pod, the long run, the podcast, I listen to it every week. He actually has a really good book. It was a Amazon bestseller called Hood, which is highly, highly recommended, very good inside the industry, uh, inside the, the biotech, inside baseball biotech type book. Uh, uh, Luke would not be promotional about his own stuff. I can do it for him. <laughs> but uh, this was fabulous. Thank you so much.